Our next reader, Lynn Jones, who's a teacher and a writer, best-selling educational book writer of painless reading comprehension, the editor for an online literary magazine, Rethinking Children's Literature, uh, and for the independent, uh, independent press, In Words Publication. She teaches English at Ball State University, and she's the educational outreach director of the Memoir Project at the Indiana Writer Center. Is that part of what we what you do in the summer? That's all part of the, the Memoir Project. So uh, th this is not on the bio, but so she we um, or she I was I just stood there and watched and talked to kids. Um, did this amazing outreach with how old? <coughs> Six to sixteen kids all summer. They were coming in and, and doing memoir projects and learning how to write at three at three different locations around the city. It's amazing. I have all these pictures of like little kids writing and like hanging off. Uh, and then they publish a book at the end of the year called I Remember. Right you can buy. It's an amazing way to teach young kids writing. Um, is to actually get them writing about their lives and thinking about themselves and and, and their place making. So. You should totally support that project because eventually those people will grow up to buy your books. Um, so she's going to be, uh, her story is Somewhere Over the Rainbow. We're going to bring her up right now. I'm not sure how I got any professional advice from Lynn. Um, I think I just learned that you I hear babies cry and I watch them grow. They'll know so much more than we'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The adapted Judy Garland lyrics of Kamaka Ovile, the Hawaiian singer's song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, have always reminded me first of my own hard life growing up. I want to make sure I say it's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I must have watched that movie, The Wizard of Oz, a hundred times when I was a kid. And I sang the song a thousand, imitating every Judy Garland vibrato, even though I probably shouldn't have been. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that I think I like that song and that I identified with that song so much is that it was sad and hopeful, like me. I remember dreaming of being swept up and out and away from where and how I lived. I dreamed of what was over that rainbow, what my yellow brick road to a better life might look like. I remember thinking about those pretty little suburban houses that, were on, that rested on tree-lined roads where they looked like a delicious dish of Dippin' Dots. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I made my way out of Oz. And my Kansas is pretty beautiful. I have been, I now am a, you know, a mom and a wife and a, and a writer and an activist, and I've been a teacher. Teacher is the one I have the strongest identity with, because I've been teaching for 24 years. K through 12, community education, in prison, and at the university. And there's nowhere that I feel that pain of sad and hopefulness more than when I teach the littles. And I remain very drawn to sad and hopeful students wherever I'm teaching them, like me. But the littles are early elementary age students. Okay, They're ages five to nine. They're incredibly wonderful because they haven't yet learned to filter. They haven't learned what we tell them in society, that you're not supposed to reveal too much or share too much. They, you ask them a question, Brad got to experience it, they will answer it with brutal honesty. You ask them to divulge, you ask them to talk about, tell a story about something that they lost or someone that they lost and they will divulge it to you, a total stranger, like it is their last confession. They write with such urgency, and it's brilliant, because what happens, and those of us who've been in education or in the writing, in the world of writing and teaching know, that at about age 11, they begin to experience fear with writing. And they bury and they protect their words. And those of us who teach writing spend a lifetime trying to get them to rediscover that seven-year-old self. And it's really genius, because I think if I could take that ability they have and combine it with the literacy skills they have yet to achieve, I would have Pulitzer Prize winners here. <laughs> I can't get some of my university students to write like this. Beautiful. So 
the littles that I get to teach um, are part of the Indiana Writers Center. Um, in 2004, we started the memoir project. Um, I said to Barb, hey, shoot, our executive director, let's take writing out of the center. So our memoir project has three components. Uh, the first one is building a legacy, where we ask seniors to talk about their lives. Uh, the other component is making memoirs, making sense. I want you to know I had no idea what I was getting myself into by titling it making memoirs and making sense. <laughs> That's another story for another day. <laughs> the other part is called Building a Rainbow. Now, Barb came up with that title, and I was really, as a half glass empty kind of gal, I was like, uh, rainbow, unicorns, pink, yeah, I don't know why I like that title at all. But she said, listen, listen, I found this really beautiful picture. And it was from the late 60s, 70s. And it's this half-constructed rainbow. And there are these little people. And they're sawing, and they're hammering, and they're painting, and there's cranes, and there's trucks, and they're building this rainbow. And it really is an effective visual metaphor because it reminds us that there are a lot of small steps that go into building something beautiful. Whether that something beautiful is a dream, or a piece of writing, or a life. So it works really well when I teach the littles, talking about building their rainbow. Now when I teach the littles and when I train our instructors and our interns and volunteers, who we desperately need, <laughs> I say, remember that it's an honor first to be trusted with someone's story. It's an honor to be trusted with their story. And I say, here's the thing, good writing, it comes from the heart and it comes from the gut, it doesn't come from your head. Good writing creates a picture in the reader's mind. Good writing, good writing is created through feeling, through action and detail. Good writing, though, does create a question in the reader's mind that there's something that the writer is desperately trying to understand or to resolve or maybe just purge. And those simple rules are really all I have to say to the littles, and they get it, and they write. So I had one girl this summer who hit every one of those bullet points spot on. Seven years old, asked her to tell her stories, now struggling with literacy skills. Struggling, had stuff to say, had trouble putting the words together to string a sentence, nothing is more frustrating. I encounter that with writers all the time, no matter the age, all the time. And they're their words, and they want to get them out. So I said, I'll write for you. You just, you just tell me your story. She told her story with such intensity. She told me the story about what happened when she was upstairs, and someone broke into her house and stole all of her Disney movies and her television, and how she was scared from that point on to ever go downstairs again. She told me the story about how when her parents were choking each other, and they wouldn't stop, and she cried and begged them to. They sent her to her room, and they kept choking each other. She told me the story about how when she went to her mother's funeral, that she pretended to be asleep because she knew that if she woke up, she would have to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. She told me the story about how her favorite shirt is a pink shirt and has a big letter M on it, and she wears it because it reminds herself that she has a mom. And as she's telling me this, and I'm writing every word, she kept bobbing and weaving and trying to look at me because she wanted me <coughs> to see it and hear it and feel it and understand it while I'm trying to write it. <laughs> and of course, my fingers couldn't leave that page. But at the end, she did something that's really beautiful that all writers I work with in the Memoir Project too. She stopped and she smiled. She wanted me to know that there was more to her than these sad stories. And she recognized they were sad. And you know, our memories are what they are. When we live it, we don't necessarily place them on some continuum. They just are our memories. But she wanted to know, she wanted me to make sure I understood there was more to her than being sad. She said, but I remember the Halloween where my mom and I dressed up like half devils and half angels and we went trick-or-treating and we ate all the candy in one night. <laughs> I remember, um, when she gave me a black Barbie doll, it had a black long ponytail, and she dressed it like the clothes that she wore, and it reminded me of her when I couldn't be with her. 
I remember, she goes, I, t I wanted you to know about my grandmothers who are wonderful and they cook for me and they take care of me and they take me to school and I love them. She wanted me to make sure there was more to her than that. Out of the mouth of babes. I mean, that was my feeling. That was in just two 60-minute sessions. I got all of that out of this one girl. It was amazing. Um, so I think that I would like to end and tell you this, because this is part of a piece that I've written and I'm moving it into a whole other piece um, that talks about the rainbow is enough. And so this is how I'm, I'm ending this piece this way because I want to move it to another direction. But somewhere over the rainbow, bluebirds fly. Why, oh why can't I? Where troubles melt like lemon drops way above the chimney tops. That's where you'll find me. I hope that that young girl continues to dream and continues to write. I hope her troubles melt right into the pages. And I hope that by giving her the opportunity to write her story and tell her story, that I've helped her move towards her rainbow. And I hope that that rainbow is enough. Thank you.